All right, good afternoon. My name is Bart. Um, I am a web developer. I've been doing Drupal for the past 10 years or so. Um, as a hobbyist a freelancer, hobbyist freelancer, um, I work for an Amsterdam-based Drupal company, and I currently work for Druid. Um, we're a mostly Finnish-based company, and we have people in Amsterdam as well as in Thailand. Um, so very global in a different kind of way. Um, I'm a backender. Um, I started out with Drupal 4.6. Uh, started writing code for Drupal around the time Drupal 5 came out, a little after that. I wrote my first contributed modules. Did the same thing for Drupal 6. Um, and when Drupal 7 was being developed, uh, I slowly got on board, uh, wrote a few patches for core, um, which was fun. Um, the onboarding process for Drupal core development is really, really fun. And, and exciting and, and empowering. And I started doing more for Drupal 8. And when we, like, early in the release cycle for Drupal 8, the choice was made to finally catch up with the rest of the world um, in, in many different ways. But one of the more fundamental differences between Drupal 8 and Drupal 7 is that Drupal 8 makes heavy, heavy use of object-oriented programming. So instead of having very, very large files with just a bunch of functions in a, what we call the global namespace, we have classes, we have interfaces, we have traits, um, we instantiate them, we have things called dependency injection, uh, which are more application level things built on top of the, the fundamental core concept of object-oriented programming. And this is, um, let me slowly advance the next slide, and this is not something that is specific to Drupal. Um, it is a very, very generic programming practice um, that has been around for decades. Um, Drupal just hasn't used it until, well, Drupal 7 a little bit, but mostly until Drupal 8. Um, PHP never really properly supported it until PHP 5. A lot of other programming languages, um, if you've been to school for IT, then you probably know this from Java or C. A lot of other programming languages like those two have been providing OOP functionality um, for years now. So we're slowly catching up, not just with the rest of the PHP world, but really just with the rest of the world, the programming world in general. Um, so when I started becoming involved with Drupal 8 development, um, I had to learn these things because um, I never went to school for programming. I, I quit university, can you imagine? Um, so I learned by doing, and I learned mostly from all the other awesome people who worked on Drupal, or who started working on Drupal before me, and who were better at these things before I became good at them. Um, so I'm really just a layperson who learned all these things by doing, by just diving into it, by asking questions, by accepting help from other people. So this is a talk that is really focused on lay people. You're not, you're not going to get all the theoretical explanations of why this works, why this is good, um, but really a down-to-earth explanation of object-oriented programming, or in this particular case, PHP developers. Um, the way I like to explain what it is, is um, that it is data typing. So we have different variable types in PHP. Um, any language, we've got integers, floats, which are decimal numbers, um, arrays, which are lists. We've got uh, simple objects. We've got all kinds of things. We've got resources in PHP. Um, but the moment you have a custom piece of data, what do you do? Um, and traditionally, up until Drupal 7, unfortunately, still a little bit of Drupal 8, we have abused, yes, we've abused arrays to be to represent data that is not technically a list, because an array is a list. Any, any single item in an array should be sort of equal in functionality to every other item. They're all coordinates. They're all URLs. They're all user objects. Um, but we have used them. We have one specific array key that, is a, that has an object as its value, one that has a, a string as its value, and that is wrong. That is really, really wrong, because you're not so, they're different. And the only way we can document these different individual array keys, for instance, is by putting code comments everywhere in our code, and it's a horrible piece of shit, because the moment you want to refactor something here, you have to change all the documentation everywhere else. So, and this is one of the situations where you would want to use objects, um, in this case for data, because arrays hold data, they don't hold functionality, um, because every object is based on a class, which is the blueprint for a piece of data, which basically defines a new type of data, like it defines a user, a piece of user data, like a user account. It defines uh, a node, it defines a term. Um, and because you define them in code, these blueprints, and 
the equivalent of an array key in an object or in a class would be a property, which is basically a variable on that class and eventually on the object created from that class, that blueprint. But you document everything right there on that class. And if you have 100,000 objects in your code at runtime, um, they're all based in the same class. If you want the documentation, look at the one class. So your documentation, your definitions, they're all in one place. Um, but as opposed to arrays, you can add functionality to classes as well. So you, basically you create a custom piece of data that you can reuse across your code base that you can check against. Like, is this variable that I'm getting here as a parameter, is it of this particular type? Just like you can check, is this an array? Is this an integer? You can also check, is this one of my custom types? And then you know exactly which properties it has, which functionality it provides. Um, and all of this allows you to, to group your data structures together to group functionality together, and um, it is conceptually much more like we humans think, because we think as of users as individual pieces, as individual objects or concepts. Um, they're not just a bunch of separate functions in our mind. Um, so this helps us develop um, software much more like we as humans think. So before we continue, um, we already discuss a few of these terms. Um, a class is really just a blueprint. A class doesn't do anything. It's defined in code, um, but it doesn't do anything until you create an object out of it. And you can create multiple objects out of one class, just like you can build multiple houses based on the same blueprint. A property, like I said, is nothing more than a variable on an object. You can define it to be internal or public. Um, it's still only a simple, dumb variable. The really cool thing, what we couldn't do before with associative arrays, is that we can have functions on classes which are called methods. Very, very confusing. Um, it's really just the same thing. Um, and we'll see how those work a little, a little later on. Um, just like you build houses based on blueprints, like literally blueprint on a piece of paper. They have CAD files these days, but I think, especially graphics, you still want to blueprint, so I can probably use that term for the rest of my presentation. Um, so you build the house, and the moment the construction company is like, yes, we finished this house, and we finished that house, and that house, the whole street, based on the same blueprint. At that particular point, the houses are practically identical. And then you start using them. Families start moving in, and each house becomes unique during its lifetime, which is equivalent to an object in PHP becoming unique during the lifetime of the current script, in the case of PHP. Um, because its state can change, its internals can change, and its internals are basically comprised by whatever is stored inside its class properties. Um, so if they start out with default values, uh, maybe it's a Boolean flag, true or false somewhere, and those can be flipped. Um, maybe there's a user object that has, has a home page property. Um, by default they're blank, but maybe you'll configure it for this user, and then differently for another. At that moment, the state has changed. But it's all internal. And it doesn't mean that you cannot necessarily access it from outside. It depends on the object, and we'll see this a little later, whether you can access it or not. But the object on its own has become unique. Its state has changed. Um, one of the, the, the things, that the problems in Drupal 7 that this solves, this whole concept, and this is completely not unique to Drupal, but we use it to replace very shitty Drupal-specific solutions from previous Drupal versions, like um, static variables in functions that we had in Drupal 7. Um, if you've never heard of these, please forget them, they're horrible. Um, so we have a class, and a class defines functionality. It defines how it works internally. Um, but very often we don't, we don't care about how it works, we just care about what are you, what can you do, what can you provide me, and that's what an interface does, because a class defines how it does something, but if you go a little step back, there are interfaces that basically let you define what a class should do. We call those contracts, and you fulfill them. If um, we have a user interface, which basically says, I can expose a username, I can expose an ID, um, I can build a link to the homepage of the user, that's fine. I don't care how it does it internally. We can have different classes that follow the same contract, that implement the same interface, that do this completely differently, but the end result is still that if I call the get URL method, I get a URL to the homepage of that user. And this is roughly what it looks like. Um, very basic, I, I, I'm gonna hurt my neck like this. Um, these are two little interfaces. And as with a lot of concepts in object-oriented programming, 
they're hierarchical. So one thing can extend to another. And as we can see here, we've got the foo multiple interface at the bottom, which extends the parent interface, as we call it, the foo interface, which is defined just a couple of lines above. Um, so, and we can see inheritance here. If you have a proper IDE like PHP Storm, it shows you exactly which functionality is inherited from the parent thing. Um, but trust me when I say that this lower interface has the functionality of both of these. So if you have, if you look at this one, it has both a do foo method and it has a do foo multiple method. And as you can see, um, this looks like a function definition. Um, and it is, but it doesn't look like your average function because it doesn't have a body. There are no curly brackets with code that is executed once, once you call the function. And that's because this is the contract, this is the interface. We define what this thing should be doing, but we don't tell it how to do it. And that's what a class is for. Um, so when you start writing a piece of code, ideally you start with your interface. Um, you start with what kind of functionality do we need, and we'll figure out how to do this later. Yeah? We define the interfaces, and then when we, once we've done that, we've basically written our API, we start writing classes, and we're like, okay, we want, uh, we want a caching backend. Yeah, well, set cache, I can get cache, I can delete them, maybe a few other operations. Um, and then you're like, okay, we've, we've, we've designed our caching API. Okay, now we have to actually store these things in a cache somewhere. And, I don't know, for your development you decide on database backend caching. Yeah, because it's easy. There's always a database available. So you write a class that implements these things, and um, by default that class caches using a database table. Um, but you could also write the second caching backend class that caches in memory or on file. But because they all implement the same interface, they all specify, they, they fulfill the same contract, uh, they all say, yes, we're a caching backend. You don't need to know how we do it internally, but we are a caching backend. So calling code only depends on the interface. It doesn't care whether or not you store it in a database or in your memory, as long as it can talk to an object that says that it's a caching backend. And then we trust, as calling code, that the object we call these methods on does its job properly. What I just said. So you have interfaces, the contracts. Then you have classes which are really just the, bl 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 the blueprints, because an interface is more like the requirement, the building requirements, you could say. And then you instantiate them into objects. So this is a class that implements the interface we saw on the previous slide. And then we instantiate it. We create an instance, otherwise known as an object, out of a class. And we do that using the new keyword. Um, this is the only place you'll ever see this keyword in, in, in PHP. So it's pretty uh, not confusing. You use the name of the class, and you see two brackets there. Um, looks like a function call. Isn't technically a function call, but um, a class can define that whenever it is instantiated, a little bit of code gets executed, and that is done in what we call a constructor. It is a magic function or method on that class called underscore underscore construct. Um, and it is executed the moment you instantiate a class into an object. And that function can accept parameters, and those parameters you pass on between these brackets here. Any method or property that you want to call or access on the object, you access it using the dash greater than sign operator. So in this particular case, we call the dofoo method, remember that, from the interface? We call it on the newly created object, and we pass it a parameter uh, that's a string called world. Um, and if we look at what it does in the class here, we see that it appends it to hello. Um, so you could do hello John, like this. Um, that's really, in a nutshell, how to work with a class. We're not there yet. There are a lot more tools for building or writing object-oriented code, and one of them is abstract classes. And they're somewhere between interfaces and, and regular classes. Um, so whereas um, any class that is not abstract, that implements an interface, must provide bodies for all the methods that the interface defines. Because otherwise, if you don't have a body for a function, then your class is incomplete and you can't really create a method out of it. But sometimes you want to provide a partial implementation because it's a shared base class. Um, we have a lot more entities in Drupal 8 than we have in Drupal 7. Um, and a lot of the functionality that provide is the same for every single entity type. So we provide a base class that implements part of the functionality defined by the entity interfaces, and then all the specific stuff 
is implemented by the specific entity class. So we have an entity base class that is abstract. So it provides some implementations, but not all of them. And then we have specific entity classes for users, for nodes, for taxonomy terms that implement or provide bodies for all the remaining methods. And this is what it looks like. Um, it's a little bit more code than we just had. Um, as you can see, a class can implement, using the implements keyword, an interface. And they can implement multiple interfaces. So if you just use the same, uh, same syntax, but just separate the interface names using comments. You can do that when implementing interfaces, but you cannot do that when extending classes, like we see here. One class can extend another, but only one other class. So whereas interfaces can extend multiple other interfaces with classes, this is only limited to just the one. Um, there's a long backstory, um, which is too long for this, um, this presentation. If you're interested, look it up, because some other um, programming languages do it differently, and there are lots of pros and cons if you're interested. Um, and as you can see, um, the abstract class, abstract foo, implements the foo multiple interface and then provides a body for one of the methods. Because if we recall what we just saw, foo multiple interface has a do foo method and a do foo multiple method. And this class only provides a body for one of them, right? So that means it's abstract, and we have to use the abstract keyword before we define the class. It also means that we cannot create an object out of this directly, which is why we have a regular class, a little below, that extends this one and provides the, uh, the implementation, as we call it, for the remaining unimplemented method on that class. Um, these are all tools that you can use to um, group pieces of functionality together, reuse code, because nobody wants to write the same code twice, um, apart from the fact that copy-paste is just really a loser thing. Um, it's also very prone to bugs, because if you have the same bugs in two different places, and someone finds a bug there, you have to remember to fix it in the two different places. This is something, um, all that we've discussed so far is part of PHP, um, like early five series. So everything that we've discussed so far is possible in Drupal 7 as well, which requires PHP 5.2 or higher. Traits are from 5.3 or 5.4, so you can still use them in Drupal 7, but that means that um, you won't comply with the minimum system requirements anymore, which is fine. Um, but we do make heavy use of these in Drupal 8. And they're basically, they are copy-paste, but in a good way. Um, because what you can do is you can write one trait, which is looks like a class, which has a, uh, a couple of methods and properties on it, but then you can use it or paste it into different classes at the same time. And it looks like this. As you can see, the trait definition is Rather similar to all the definitions we've seen um, for interfaces and classes and abstract classes. And then in a regular class, you use this particular syntax to use or include or paste a trait into that class. And PHP doesn't really care about traits at all, apart from um, on compile times when it runs through your code and it parses all of it, it literally internally copy pastes the trait contents into your class, which means. The trait itself, apart from that, is really just copy-paste and it doesn't have any syntactical meaning internally. You cannot um, check a class's type using a trait. Well, you can, but you wouldn't want to do that runtime because it's slow, it doesn't matter. Uh, and a trait cannot implement an interface. Um, so at the moment, if you were to write a trait to provide a default implementation of some of the methods on an interface, like we see here, which is a do-foo method, which is defined on foo interface. Um, so we wrote the trait to implement that method, but because we cannot make a trait implement an interface straight away, this trait could as well be for something else. The moment we use it in a class, which then implements the interface, this is when the PHP parse checks, okay, this class provides a do foo method. It doesn't care where it's from, it doesn't care that it's from a trait. The class provides a do foo method. Does the method comply with what the interface specifies? Because if we provide a do foo method and the interface says that it takes one argument, one parameter, and um, in our implementation it requires two parameters, you get a big fat parse error by PHP saying that you have a method that pretends to be um, an implementation of this interface, but it doesn't. And the reason is very simple. If something says that it implements foo interface, it means you should be able to call it like it is foo interface. The moment it requires one extra parameter, it's no longer portable. It no longer follows that type. And any code that randomly gets that object that says that it implements foo interface expects to be able to only pass on one argument. Not two, because that's not what the interface said. 
That's why you get errors by PHP telling you in advance, in your face, that you did something wrong. And it takes a bit of time to get used to, uh, but these, these, these errors, that um, they're very big, they're very bright, your, your, your code will just crash and burn. It's very useful because you did something fundamentally wrong. It's good to know about these things before you deploy it in public. Deploy it in public. So we've seen that um, interfaces can extend other interfaces. Uh, classes can extend one other class. Traits can extend traits too in much the same way, although it's not usually very um, um, very useful to do so for lots of practical reasons that you'll probably figure out in practice yourself. Um, and this is an interesting one because if um, if two classes can extend each other, and the parent class provides a do foo method for the body, and the child class as well, what happens? What happens is that child classes have priority over parent classes. So if both classes provide a method with the same name and signature, the child method has preference. So that one is actually executed. However, the child can decide to also internally call the method of the parent class. And you do that using the parent colon colon notation. And then you put the, the do foo part and the parameters are exactly the same as in any other method call. The parent colon colon is when you access anything from your parent. Um, and that's really cool, for instance, if you have a base class, and you, like for entities, you have an entity base class, and you have a user, and the user says, I like the base implementation. I really, really like it, but I want to add one little thing. Um, like we see here, um, we want to make the greeting a little bit more polite. We like the greeting, but we want to make it a little bit more polite. So we call the parent implementation, we use the output, and then we add a little bit to it. Yeah? So there are the two different uh, reasons uh, or uh, things you can do with the overriding parent class. It really depends on what you need. Do you want to reuse what's in the parent, or do you not want to reuse it? This is cool. This is, this is really, really cool. And this is also really, really magic. Um, because the variable this is a reserved variable in PHP. You can never, never use it anywhere. You, you can never define it yourself. You can never assign a variable to it, really. It's a magic variable that exists only within methods on objects. This is what it looks like. We have a class here. So I imagine that we have an, an object. We did new foo, so we have an object that we can call methods on. And then we see, yes, here is this. Where did it come from? PHP magically populates that this variable with the object we call the method on. So if we do, uh, I don't know, dollar sign bar is new foo, then this automatically refers to the value of the bar variable as well. It's the exact same object because objects are passed on by reference to PHP. So if you call a function or a method in PHP and you pass on anything that is a simple value, um, so uh, strings, uh, numbers, arrays, um, they're copied. Yeah? So if you pass on an array to a function, it becomes a copy of the original array in that function. But objects never become copies. Objects are always passed on and called by reference. They're always the exact same values, no matter how, how often you pass them on in your code base. Um, so that's why this can refer to the exact same value as that of the variable outside of the class. So what it does here is imagine that this is just the bar value that we created outside this class. We call the do foo multiple method on that with the exact same notation as we here now call the do foo method on the object itself. And this is useful for instance for splitting up functionality on a class. Um, smaller pieces of code are better. They're easier to test, easier to oversee, because we're still humans, we're still bags of flesh and blood, and we can do a lot of awesome things, but no way that we can actually keep an overview of an entire code base in our heads and know exactly what goes on. So the smaller the portions, the easier it is for us to understand, the easier it is for us to spot bugs or possible performance improvements. So what you want to do, and we already did that in the earlier Drupal versions, is where we have large functions and we split them up in smaller pieces. So primary functions call other functions internally. And these internal functions, um, we would prefix them with an underscore in the earlier Drupal versions. That was kind of our convention for saying, like, don't call this function directly. It's kind of internal. You might want to use the other one instead. 
Um, so that's a reason for splitting these things up. And um, what this does, does is it basically uses the existing implementation of foo and just combines it all together using the imploder. Um, there are there's a multitude of other reasons why you would split this up. Um, and that brings us the internal functions to visibility. Um, because even though we prefix functions in the center below with, a, with an underscore, saying that these are internal to call them, you could completely ignore that advice and just call them directly, no matter what. However, with OOP functionality in PHP, um, we can literally control this. Like we can tell in our PHP code that this is an internal function. Don't call this from outside. It will give you a PHP error, and it will. Um, and these are the three different visibility levels. Public is basically what we've always been used to. Um, everybody from anywhere, any part of the code base, can call or access this property or this method. Protected is what we use for pretty much all internal stuff. You can only call it from within the class that you're in, or any child class, or any other class, any other object that is an, um, an instance of the same class. Because if you have two objects that both um, that are both made from the foo class, they, they share the same internal structure. So they are allowed to access each other's protected properties and methods because that structure is exactly the same as in their class. They know what they're talking about. Private is really, really strict. That's like, no, 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 no. We will not let anyone ever access these things unless you're in this particular class yourself, not even in a child class. It's generally advised not to use these um, because private means that someone can't extend your class and add something to your functionality because then if they extend your class from their class, they cannot call any of your private methods. So generally, if something is internal, we use protected. One more important thing is, now that we have defined these three levels of visibility and the consequences, we know that we can change it. If we create a method that has a visibility level and we want to change that, we can do so, but only in one direction. Otherwise, it would break calling code. If something is private, we can make it protected later, and then we can make it public. Because anything that is um, protected can be accessed just like it is private. Plus, it can be accessed in a few other ways. Same thing for public, it can be accessed like it was protected or private, but it can also be accessed from outside. So making it less strict during development is perfectly fine. It will not break anything. If you make it more strict during development, you will break backwards compatibility, and um, you shouldn't do that unless you release a new major version of your code. Example, the visibility indicator or keyword goes before the function keyword when you declare a function. It's all in the same line, just like we have abstract class something, we have protected function something. This is where we get back to what we discussed in the beginning, data types. Um, you want to use classes for documentation and to group everything together, but the really cool part is when you can runtime check the type of an object, and there are two ways of doing that. One of them is as an argument to a function or a method. And um, you may know this from Drupal 7 already, where we type into it using array, like um, we had form functions that said, um, module underscore form underscore blah, first parameter array space dollar sign form. That told PHP that any value passed on to that parameter must be an array. Cool. We can do that with objects too. Um, we just instead of the word array, we specify the name of the class and the interface that the value must implement or be an instance of. The other one is where we have um, more inline checking um, so the first one is really just when you pass on an argument, the second one is in running code. If you have a block of code in the middle, you want to see, oh, is this variable indeed of this type? You would use instance of. And these are an example of both of these ty uh, types of type checking in the same piece of code. You can see that we specify the name foo interface here. So when we call this function foo, the variable, the, the value of the foo parameter must be an instance of a class that implements foo interface. If it's not, PHP will whine at you for doing something the wrong way. Um, so this piece of code basically requires a foo interface object. That's fine. But if you, as you can see in the if statement here, it has some special handling for objects that are instances of classes that also implement foo multiple interface. And that's what we do in an if statement with the instance of operator. This whole condition basically returns a boolean. 
Um, so you can use it in, in, in any other way, um, in, in any other situation that would require a Boolean. Um, so the array version of this would be using the function is underscore array, which returns a Boolean. This also returns a Boolean. It's, it's really easy to use. If the, the notation is a little different from what we're used to. Um, but using these two types, it's very easy to make sure that you know that you actually have the right type of data. Um, this um, is in contrast with what we call duct typing, which is something that, for instance, JavaScript uses in Ruby and Python. They don't have these types. They have classes or things that look like classes, but you can't actually check for types in your function parameters. Um, so they basically expect the calling code to pass on an object of the right type. We can actually specify it and make things break, tell the developer you screwed up, and that is absolutely fantastic. Because if you screwed up, you'd want to know earlier rather than later, right? So you can fix it before anyone notices. So um, you don't know. Your boss doesn't have to know that you made, you made a mistake. Because we all make mistakes. So does he or she. Nobody needs to know, as long as you can fix it on time. And that's what this is really useful for. It also provides you with documentation because it makes the code more expressive, more self-descriptive, because the code itself tells you, without the need for a doc block, we still write doc blocks, but without the need for it, the code tells you, I need this. This is not an object-oriented or programming approach or anything, but it uses the concept of um, that PHP provides for OOP code um, to provide really cool features. Because um, who worked with the registry in Drupal 7? Who hates its guts? Oh, you have led such a happy life. Um, we have all these tons of codes. I wind about long files with tons and or hundreds of functions uh, in it and losing over it, right? Um, so we want to split things up. And we can do that in classes. But that means we've got new classes, but they're still in the same files. Which still leaves us with very, very long files, just the functions have, grouped, have been grouped a little bit. So we kind of want to split them up in different files. Um, OK, how do we load them? Because in, in Drupal 7, we just had a .module file, which contained mostly of it, and we had a few .inc files that we referenced you know, for menu callbacks or whatever. Um, but we want to split things up more and more and more. Uh, but if you have all these files, how do you include them? What is, What's an easy way to do that? And in Drupal 7, we had the registry, which was a, a database-powered auto-loading system. Um, in your modules.info file, you have a list of the files that contain classes or interfaces. And whenever your module would be installed, Drupal would check these files, open them up, read them, check which classes and interfaces were in there, put that list in the database with a map to the file name, and then every single time some code needed that of those classes, it would check the database. Oh, this class, which file does it belong to? Okay, include it. Apart from the fact that this sounds a little silly, it's totally bloody horrible because what if you are um, experiencing an issue with your database and then it needs a class to process that error? It doesn't work because to load that class, you need your database, which was actually the cause of the problem in the first place. Um, so there's this group called the FIG, Framework Interoperability Group, and there are um, a bunch of really, really smart people uh, from all kinds of PHP frameworks across the globe. Um, across the globe doesn't really mean anything these days anymore. Um, but our, our Krell, Larry Garfield, is a representative of Drupal on that organization. And what they do is they set up standards to make sure that different people's PHP code works together as nicely as possible. And one of those standards is PSR4. PSR means PHP standard condition. The four is just an arbitrary number to identify the standard, it doesn't mean anything. And what it does, well this thing, um, it maps class names to file names. Hey. So we don't have random files in which we put our classes. We're starting to get some order in chaos here. Predictability. One of the things this new in PHP 5.4 is namespaces. Basically, they allow you to have multiple classes with the exact same name in your code, loaded at the same time, as long as they are in a different namespace, which is kind of a prefix kind of thing. Um, but by these conventions, we have predictability. If we register namespaces to directories, like um, for Drupal, we have a name, namespaces are separated by backslashes, um, like we can see here. The namespace is backslash Drupal, backslash module name is our convention. And then 
This little piece is mapped to the source directory in any module for Drupal 8. You can do the exact same thing in Drupal 7 using the X autolog module. Um, it is an absolute beautiful piece of work, uh, and I would recommend using it. Um, so we tell the autoloader that this thing maps to the source directory, and anything after that, as you can see, entity maps to entity, payment interface maps to payment interface of PHP. So we map class names or interface names to file names, plus.php. And then we map namespaces to directories. Before that, we register a namespace root with a directory root, and we have predictability. So given a class name or an interface name with its namespace, we know exactly where that file is located because we told the system where to start looking. If it starts with Drupal slash payment, look at the source directory of the payment module, and it knows exactly where to find it. We don't need a database. We don't need to store a map of arbitrary relationship between class names and file names. We know exactly where to find it, which means this shit is fast. It runs starting um, in the bootstrap of Drupal. This works. It doesn't need a database connection. It's fast, it's foolproof, and everybody else uses it. That means that if you write an arbitrary PHP package that has its classes structured like this, it will work with any other PHP project that also has an autoloader according to this standard. All right, why? Why this whole presentation? Classes are faster than arrays since PHP 5.3, I think. Uh, they used to be a little slower, but they're faster mainly because you define your properties. The moment you start using dynamic class properties, you're screwed. But as long as you only use the properties that are defined in your class, you have a lower memory consumption. So on top of the documentation that we already had, we have a faster system. If you use a proper IDE, and I highly recommend that if you start working on Drupal 8, because of all the tons of files and, and inheritance, the extension, the class extension and all that, um, anything like text edit or text made or text rang or um, just will make navigating the code base hell, use a proper PHP integrated development environment. Um, I'm a fan of PHP Storm. I think there are, or Sublime is another one, I think. Um, use it, it will make your life easier because you can spend more time on coding than actually finding the right piece of code. Um, but these pieces of software, um, they use all this information to help you write code faster and with less errors. Uh, partly because they can use static code analysis, they can analyze the code without running it, because of these type hints, for instance. Um, and if you type hint that your variable must be foo interface, and you want to call a method on that variable, PHP knows exactly which methods are available in full interface and give you a, a, a suggestion list like these are, uh, methods are available. And if you call a method that is not on full interface, it will tell you you call the non-existent method before you even ran the code and the parser told you that you were wrong. It takes a little bit more boilerplate, like writing a class, it, it does a little bit of overhead and you have to define the class, it has to have a doc bucket and everything, but that's not logical code. That's very simple stuff. Um, you, cannot, you cannot have any bugs there, because it's, it's not logical code. Um, all the other stuff becomes faster and more bug-free. It just makes you a damn better developer. That's really what this is. I'll upload this presentation to SlideShare. This is me again, in case, uh, in case somehow I've managed to pique your interest. Any questions about this lovely new stuff? Static classes? Or like class oh, with only right. static uh, methods? Right. Oh, um, yeah, that's actually, um, there was a bit of confusion here. Um, I talked about static variables. If you have a static variable in a function, it will retain its value even when it's called after, like, in, in subsequent function calls. Um, the question was um, whether I like static methods on classes. Um, and the, the confusion here is because we use the static keyword in PHP in a few different ways. Uh, we also use the use keyword in different ways. Um, so be aware of that. Static methods and classes are methods that you can call that functions without having to instantiate that class into an object. Um, and then you really use the class just to be able to group functionality. Um, also, if you have a static method, there's no this. There's no magic variable this because you're not working on an object. And I mostly dislike them. Um, it, it's basically most people in the PHP community have realized that it's actually bad. Um, if it's something global, if 
your function or your method doesn't need anything from outside the class, like it's a small utility function to split a string up or do some UTF-8 UTF operations on it, um, then you can have a static method. If it needs something from outside, like it needs these, like the user entity storage, for instance, then you should not ever make it a static method because then it has to talk to the, for in this particular case, the user entity storage object, which is then stored in a property on the class that the method is on. And this whole concept is called dependency injection, that a piece of code should never talk to anything outside of itself. So if it needs anything from outside, you need to inject it first. I highly recommend that you read up on that. Uh, there are other presentations about this. It's beyond the scope of this one. Dependency injection, look it up. Um, it's really cool stuff, makes your code more testable and more portable. Um, so depend, depending on what exactly the code needs to do, I like it or I don't. It's long discussion. Any more questions? No? Thank you very much for coming. I hope I managed to um, give you a bit of a kickstart towards working on Drupal 8. Uh, this stuff isn't easy, so um, if you feel confused, it's not you. If you need help with this, um, look up these keywords or just go on IRC to the Drupal channels and ask someone, help, I'm porting this module to Drupal 8 and I'm completely stuck. Um, we'd be happy to help you. Thanks.